What if the Americas were never colonized? Like, this is a question that has been considered by historians and denizens of the internet alike as people struggle to come to terms with what a world would look like if the West, as we know it, simply did not exist. If it was never founded in the first place, and I mean, think about it, no colonization, no trade goods, no products, no conquest that would form the North American or South American states that we know today, simply nothing. But this is a question that not only has an infinite number of possibilities for how it would end up, but far too many things would need to occur in order for these scenarios to work out in the first place. But what do I mean? To build these scenarios, we will have to go back to the beginning and look at this world as a whole. Now, this was in an era known as the Age of Exploration, which is sometimes called the Age of Discovery, which officially began in the early 15th century and it lasted all the way through the 17th century. That is a period that is characterized as a time when Europeans began exploring the world by sea, looking for new trade routes, for wealth, for knowledge, for everything of the sort. Many nations were looking for goods such as gold and silver, but one of the biggest reasons for exploration was the desire to find new routes for the spice and silk trade. Now you may wonder, why is that important? Well, when the Ottoman Empire took control of Constantinople in 1453, it blocked off European access to the area, which severely limited trade. In addition, it also blocked access to North Africa, as well as the Red Sea, which were two very important trade routes to the Far East that had been in use for generations, going back millennia, even all the way to when Rome controlled Egypt. Now, the first of these journeys associated with the Age of Discovery were conducted by the Portuguese. And although the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italians, and all different others in this area had been plying the Mediterranean for generations, most sailors kept well within the sight of shore. They would travel known routes between ports. But Henry the Navigator of Portugal, he changed that, encouraging explorers to sail beyond the mapped routes and discover new routes to West Africa. Portuguese explorers discovered the Madeira Islands in 1419 and the Azores in 1427. Over the coming decades, they would push further south along the African coast, reaching the coast of present-day Senegal by the 1440s, and then the Cape of Good Hope by 1490. Less than a decade later, in 1498, Vasco da Gama would follow this route all the way to India. With the Portuguese making headway in the east, the Spanish too desired a route to India, but they sought to make their journey west. After all, the Portuguese were ahead of them in establishing forts and trade outposts all along the way through Africa. Thus, Christopher Columbus, an Italian who was working for the Spanish monarchy, made his first journey in 1492. But instead of reaching India, Columbus found the island of San Salvador in what is known today as the Bahamas. He also explored the island of Hispaniola, which is the home of modern-day Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Now, Columbus would lead three more voyages into the Caribbean, exploring parts of what is today Cuba and the Central American coast. The Portuguese also reached the New World when explorer Pedro Alvarez Cabral explored Brazil, setting off a conflict between Spain and Portugal over the newly claimed lands. And as a result, the Treaty of Tordesillas officially divided the world in half in 1494, between Spain in the west and Portugal in the east, but also with Brazil in the case of Portugal. Now, Columbus's journey opened the door for the Spanish conquest of the Americas. During the next century, there would be men such as Hernan Cortes and Francisco Pizarro who would decimate the Aztecs of Mexico, the Incas of Peru, and the other indigenous peoples of the Americas. By the end of the Age of Exploration, Spain would rule from the southwestern United States to the southernmost reaches of Chile and Argentina. These lands would bring in riches for Spain. Treasure ships laden with silver and gold would make their way back to the old world of Europe, fueling Spanish commerce and dominance while inflaming European rivalries over these newly discovered lands. And it wouldn't be just them. Great Britain and France also began seeking new trade routes and lands across the ocean. In 1497, John Cabot, an Italian explorer working for the English, reached what is believed to be the coast of Newfoundland. A number of French and English explorers followed, including Giovanni de Vezzerano, who discovered the entrance to the Hudson River in 1524, and Henry Hudson, who mapped the island of Manhattan first in 1609. Over the next decades, the French, Dutch, and British would all vie for dominance. England established the first permanent colony in North America at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, and Samuel du Champlain founded Quebec City in 1608, and Holland established a trading outpost in what is today 
New York City in 1624. Over the next few centuries, native control of the varying American territories would be whittled down to almost nothing, as European settlers would go on to create states of their very own, one of which would go on in the 20th and 21st centuries to dominate the global stage and market in its military and commercial influence, the United States of America. But what if this were not the case? What if, for some reason, the Americas were never colonized? What would the world look like? It's a huge question to answer, and there are a multitude of factors that must be considered for the perfect hypothetical of no colonization. Now, perfect no colonization in this case refers to the idea that Europeans never set foot in the Americas in the first place, but this is a nearly impossible scenario. Now, at first glance, this may seem like the more reasonable answer, as it was a very real possibility that Columbus never would have made it to the Americas in the first place. The little fleet that he had left from Spain on August 3rd, 1492, and after nearly a month in the Canaries, the ship set out from San Sebastian de la Gomera on September 6th. On several occasions in September and then in October, sailors spotted floating vegetation and various types of birds, all of which were taken as signs that there has to be land nearby. But by October 10th, the crew had begun to lose patience. They were complaining that with all their failure to make landfall, that the winds and shortage of provisions would cause them to stop being able to return home. Mutiny was close, but Columbus kept a hold of the crew, and two days later, on October 12th, land was sighted, bringing them into the view of the Bahamas. Now, if the crew had simply mutinied and taken the ship home, then that would be one possibility. But the, with the sight of vegetation and birds, there was very clearly an indicator to the crew that something was out there. Anyone that learned of this in a few years may well try another expedition, but this time they would be prepared for a longer journey. The more realistic answer is that Columbus never makes it because the ships go down in a storm. Mind you, this is a very real possibility, particularly in unknown waters, as the entire expedition could have easily just sunk beneath the waves disappearing from history and discouraging others from attempting such an expedition again. No Columbus, no discovery, right? Well, no. You see, even if Columbus had not actually discovered the Americas, then there were other explorers that would have. One of these as an example is Pedro Cabral, if you recall him from earlier. Pedro Cabral set sail from Lisbon, Portugal on March 9th, 1500. He had a fleet of around 13 vessels and 1,200 men, including the famed explorer Bartholomew Diaz. Diaz was in command of one of the vessels. Cabral and his fleet sailed past the Canary Islands and Cape Verde Islands off of the coast of Africa. And shortly after leaving, one of Cabral's ships was missing, believed to have sunk. Cabral was to follow the exact same route as da Gama around Africa to reach India. But he accidentally sailed too far south, into the Atlantic Ocean. This accident brought him to the South American coast and to a new land unknown to the Europeans. Cabral realized that this land was not India. He had his fleet make anchor at Port Seguro, which was off the coast of present-day Bahia. Now, they went ashore and erected a large wooden cross, which he then used to claim the land in the name of Portugal. And after his discovery, Cabral immediately sent a ship back to inform the Portuguese king of what it was that he had found. In order to assume that the discovery did not occur in the first place, you would need Columbus, you would need Cabral, and any other explorers that possibly would ever be sent out for years, decades, even centuries to simply never make it, or at least not make it and be able to tell the tale. And that is not something that is very realistic. Someone was going to find the Americas again, even if it was only a few decades later, and that is going to start the process of what we know it in our timeline all over again. And I mean, we all know how this plays out. Contact with the Europeans would bring disease, Diseases such as smallpox would wipe out nearly 90% of the native populations over the course of the next century, and then this rapid loss of population combined with European occupations would lead to political, social, and supply crises that would destabilize and ruin almost every large society in the Americas. But that is what most people don't realize. The true success of colonization was not from guns. It was not from superior technology. It was from disease. When the Spanish conquered the Aztec Empire, it was done with only a force of around 800 conquistadors, but along with many thousands of allied natives that sought to bring down the oppressive Aztecs. As disease spread rapidly among the Aztecs and their native allies, there was very little that they could actually do to resist further Spanish encroachment and taking of power. 
Prior to 1492, the native population of the Americas had been estimated to have been around 60 million people. Only 100 years later, around 6 million. In many areas through North America, colonists simply could move in and claim land as many years prior. The majority of people that had been there simply ceased to exist, often decades before anyone saw a European in the first place. Thus, it does not matter if this occurs in 1492 or 1592. The result, in the end, would likely be the same. But what if the natives had some level of immunity to smallpox and other diseases in the first place? Now, mind you, that is not an impossible scenario. We have definitive proof that the Vikings had discovered and attempted to colonize the Americas in the beginning of the 11th century, almost 500 years before the Spanish ever did. Though this was not as successful as the settlement was abandoned a few years later. We do know that the Vikings did have contact with the natives as they referred to them as something called Skraelings. It is from this initial interaction that one could reasonably say that some of the diseases that Europeans had would have been introduced to the Americas, and much like what occurred in the 14th and 15th century, these diseases would travel and spread among the natives, wiping out much of the population and cursing them to a fate that was very similar to Europe during the bubonic plague. But that's just it. Just like Europe after the Black Death, the population would bounce back, stronger and more resilient to the disease. Millions would be lost, yes, that is still something that is going to happen, and societies would crumble. But with almost 500 years prior to the arrival of more Europeans, there would be time to rebuild. New city-states would arise in what is today Mexico, perhaps similar to the Aztec of our timeline. Perhaps the Inca or some other great empire would still form in South America prior to the arrival of the Spanish. The actual political sphere of this new world may be very different or very similar, but to be honest, we don't really have a way to tell. So for the sake of argument, let's assume that it is the same, just making it easier. The entities such as the Aztec, the Inca, the Iroquois, the others that we know of in our timeline are still there. They still exist. They formed over the course of those 500 years. So what happens? The Spanish arrived in the Americas in 1492 under the leadership of Columbus. After finding some gold, some spices, and other exotic goods, and then presenting them to the Spanish monarchs, further voyages were funded that included missionaries and soldiers to lay claim to the lands in the name of the crown. These would see a series of outposts and positions that would be negotiated or conquered from local tribes and the peoples in the Caribbean islands whose inhabitants were not nearly as populous or as organized as on the mainland of Mexico and South America. Further expeditions would be launched by other explorers and conquistadors to discover more lands and then take more riches. Now, historically, these Spanish conquistadors were primarily poor nobles from the impoverished western and southern parts of Spain, and they were able to conquer huge empires in the New World with the help of superior military technology, disease, and military tactics, which included surprise attacks and, more importantly, powerful alliances with local tribes. Once an area had been conquered, it would be partitioned into something known as a economienda, or a grant of land. But more importantly, the native people themselves were parceled out to the conquistadors, who would be given title to the land and its people in return for a promise to teach the natives Christianity. This system was heavily abusive, to say the least, and Native Americans throughout the Americas were reduced to conditions that were tantamount to virtual slavery, if not outright slavery at different points. But without disease to wipe out the majority of resistance, expansion is very slow and is most certainly not permanent. Alliances are still made with the native chiefs and the lords to assist one or the other against their enemies in return for land grants or other things, but Spanish control of an area would likely be tenuous at best, and it would be a small minority of Spaniards with very limited supplies of modern equipment against a vastly numerically superior native force that might just team up with other natives to drive out the Spanish. After all, this is the early 1500s, and the Urquebus is not exactly a modern machine gun that will decide victory for the technologically superior Europeans. Now, what this effectively means is that colonization is still going to occur, but it's not going to be nearly on the same scale as what we had seen historically. Much in the same way as the Portuguese would establish forts and trade outposts along the coast of Africa, moving all the way to India, but not necessarily venturing very far inland, so too would the Spanish in the Americas. Areas that could be readily controlled with just a few men would still likely be done, just as was the case with a number of the Caribbean islands, but due to the limitations of technology at the time, a trip to and from the Americas to Europe would still take several months, meaning any kind of reinforcements were not only going to be time-consuming to get there, 
but also expensive as well. Without large-scale gold and silver imports from the Americas on treasure ships, there really is not much justification for sending further shipments of men and material down to fight against what is most certainly a far more numerically superior enemy. Plantations would still be set up for products such as sugar and other things, but these are going to be far fewer as Europeans do not control nearly as much land, and it does not become nearly accessible as a result in the beginning to European markets as it did in our timeline. In addition, the workers of said plantations were natives to begin with historically, but due to the harsh treatment as well as disease, these quickly died off and were replaced by African slaves that were more resistant. The profits from sugar would go on to purchase textiles, rum, and guns in Europe, which in turn would purchase slaves from African kingdoms set up along the coast of Africa. These slaves would then produce more of the products on the plantations, giving us what we know of as today the triangular trade network of history. But with no disease, few if any slaves would actually need to be purchased from Africa, breaking the triangular trade into a mere bilateral trade with two segments in the Americas. Sugar and other products would still be exported to Europe, and then manufactured goods would then be exported back to the Americas for both the plantations and also the natives themselves who would engage with trade. The native city-states of Mexico that had fought each other for centuries for dominance would likely in turn supply human prisoners to the Spanish as slaves in exchange for said goods and weapons. Thus, native tribes that aligned themselves as close trading partners of the Spanish would gain an edge over their rivals, importing advanced equipment in order to use in battle and then take more territory. This would lead to a further escalation of conflicts across the Americas as tribes expanded and then consolidated their power to form their own empires, though many of these would likely still be quite small in the beginning. After all, there were no domesticated, rideable animals that were utilized by tribes in the Americas prior to the arrival of Europeans, and thus, travel was done either by foot or by canoe, limiting travel speed and weakening the level of control one would have. But as horses and other domesticated creatures are imported, the first tribes to obtain and breed them would have a grand edge over their rivals, allowing them not only to expand far more rapidly in the first place, but then simultaneously maintain control of their newly conquered territory. Now the wealth brought in from this trade with Spain would be nice, but it was not nearly as ludicrous as it was in our timeline, limiting the funds for Spanish ambitions in Europe without the resources to back their claims. Without being able to divert too many troops to America or Europe, focus instead may lay in Northern Africa or the Maghrebi pirates that preyed upon European shipping for centuries. England and France would see this wealth and would try to follow similar paths to the Spanish, much as they had done in our timeline, but coastal trade colonies would be set up along the North American coast of Virginia and Canada, and with a less populated area than Mexico and South America, it is possible that more of this land would be taken and occupied by Europeans. That being said, the natives of this space would be significantly larger in number and would still restrict Europeans to the coast. With no thoughts of conquering cities of gold as they had in our timeline, as the Spanish had made no such grand conquests, more trade-oriented relationships would be established as North American tribes competed with one another over fur trapping grounds to import more products. Now while this would be valuable, it would not be nearly as lucrative as trade in the Caribbean. English, French, and Dutch traders and colonists would move in to establish competing Caribbean colonies just as they did in our timeline to try and dominate American trade. And just like the Portuguese and Dutch in Asia, the European powers would compete with each other over trade rights and territory, further safeguarding natives who were then able to play the Europeans off of each other for trade concessions. Now it was not just the continent of Europe that would have been affected by this. In our timeline, the direct control of much of Latin and South America had brought in huge amounts of mineral wealth to Spain, and the newly created silver mines in these areas were a necessary catalyst for Asian trade which was the true goal of Europe in the first place. Without these mines, there was a far more limited supply of precious metal that would be used to pay China for goods, such as silks, spices, and tea. And this trade format was necessary as China was only allowed to trade in silver for its products as it saw no need for any inferior barbarian goods to be exchanged in kind. Thus, more focus and direct colonization would be brought by the Europeans against varying islands in what is today Indonesia in an effort to secure and control the spice trade from its source. That being said, no European power would hold dominance in the area, with perhaps the exception of the Portuguese, who had long held sway in the east before the arrival of the Dutch. Resources would still be imported to Europe, which would fuel early industrialization over the next several centuries, albeit 
at perhaps a slower pace, as with less resources being produced to provide said fuel, in the first place, it was likely to move slower. None of the other European powers would necessarily outpace the other, at least naturally, as with increased competition, when one great power would become too powerful or influential in the region, the others would seek to balance them out, much as they had in the 19th century in our timeline. So technology still advances, though perhaps at a slightly slower pace. Steam-powered vessels and engines are developed in Europe, cutting down travel time drastically between Europe, Asia, and America, while simultaneously causing a boom in industry. With this boom comes a need for more resources, and Europe once again looks back at the Americas as well as Africa. Economic needs plus concern over the possibility of a grand world-spanning conflict would cause Europe to seek a more diplomatic solution for the sake of easing tensions. The results of this would be something akin to the Berlin Conference that we saw in our time, where Africa was quickly divided up amongst European powers in an event known as the Scramble for Africa. But this time, it is not just Africa that is going to be divided up. North America and South America are also going to be divided as different European powers step in to take pieces of said pie, with much more advanced tech, repeatable firearms, and significantly quicker travel speeds. The Americas and Africas, with their less industrialized populations, are very quickly swallowed up in rapid order. The English, French, Dutch, German, Russian, and Nordic countries would pick apart the Americas while largely leaving Africa for Portugal, Spain, Italy, Austria, and the Ottomans. With so many targets for external conquest, conflict, for a time, is limited among the European powers. But by the mid-20th century, these rivals would flare once again, leading to a crisis that may engulf the entire world in flame. A true world war. And with that, we are going to end things here today. Truthfully, at this point, there are an infinite number of possibilities for how this could end up, and there are an infinite number of possibilities for what could have happened in the middle of me describing these stories that would have resulted in something completely different. At this point, we really wouldn't know. But I appreciate all of you for watching, and I do hope that you stick around for the next one. If there's anything that you think that I did wrong, then please let me know ahead in the comments here. If there's something that you want me to cover next, please let me know there as well. I appreciate all of you for watching. Thank you so much, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye.